And it's such a nice occasion. It's one of the best things that we do in academia, you know, is to um, award people, a, a, give them a chance for an inaugural lecture for the professorship. And it's especially a great pleasure for me to introduce Sophie, Professor Sophie von Stumm, uh, who I think is, is really one of the brightest um, young researchers in, and actually, in what? Um, what's interesting is that uh, it's hard to say in what, because she's been employed as a personality researcher at Goldsmith, as a developmental psychologist and social psychologist at the London School of Economics, and now as an educational psychologist at York. In addition, she's an excellent statistician, and she's taken genetics and genomics in stride in the last few years. She's also interested in the effects of early life experiences on cognitive development, uh, in technologies for big data, and in the role of personality in the learning. So in this age of increasing specialization, you know, learning more, uh, more and more about less and less in a way, Professor von Stumm's interdisciplinarity is, I think, her greatest strength. She has the energy and intelligence to bring these very disparate fields together to create synergies in research. Um, she's accomplished so much, it's hard to imagine that she received her PhD only nine years ago, in 2010. After her PhD, which was from Goldsmiths University of London, she began what I think must be a record for academic achievement, five posts in seven years. She began as a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chichester. After one year, she moved to the University of Edinburgh to accept an ESRC-funded postdoctoral fellowship. In 2012, she went back as a faculty member to the Department of Psychology at Goldsmiths, where she stayed for five years, her longest interlude by far. In 2017, she accepted a post um, to help set up a new psychology department at the London School of Economics, LSE. And last year, she accepted her current position as Professor of Psychology and Education at the Department of Education here at the University of York, which is the reason for today's celebration. In what must be another record, Professor von Stumm has gotten every post for which she interviewed, including, you probably don't know, a professorship in Germany, which she turned down in order to come to York. Despite her peripatetic academic life, moving to five posts in seven years, Professor von Stumm has been a prolific scientist. She's authored more than 50 peer-reviewed journals, including 30 as first author. Three examples of her research. I was going to give you three examples of her research, but I think she'll talk about these. And I, I, I'm told that I should limit my talk to five minutes. So I, I could have told you about her interest in effects of early family environments on cognitive development and her other long-term interest in curiosity, which is where the Hungry Minds title comes from. Um, including her lab. And I do think it's uh, a key uh, cardinal trait of Professor von Stumm is her curiosity. That's what drives her interest in so many different things. And then the third example is new. I'm going to read this one because this is the most interesting. Although not a geneticist by training, Professor von Stumm has moved into the forefront of the DNA revolution as it sweeps into the behavioral sciences. For example, she and her team showed for the first time that intergenerational social mobility is in part influenced by genetic factors. She's begun to combine DNA with her interest in environment to study the interplay between genes and environment in development. One of her most recent papers is called Predicting Educational Achievement from Genomic Measures, DNA, and Socioeconomic Status. It traces the influence of DNA and SES and their interaction on educational achievement throughout the school years. Using growth curve models, an example of her statistical expertise, she showed that DNA and SES independently predict educational achievement in the first year of school, and they also account for systematic changes in achievement across the school years. So I think that's going to be a particularly important paper. Professor von Stumm has an excellent track record as seen in terms of the standard criteria of grants, awards, and leadership. For example, she's received grants from this is a long list, I'll, I'll skim some of it. European Foundation for Alcohol Research, the Royal Society, the Jacobs Foundation, the British Academy, the Lieberhume Foundation, and the Wellcome Trust. She also has several awards for her research, such as the Rising Star Award from the American Psychological Association, the Ex Excellence in Research Award from the Mensa Foundation, and the Early Career, I know, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> and the Early Career Award from the International Society for the Study of Individual Differences. How about that? <laughs> She's also on the editorial board of several journals and, a, journals and an associate editor of two journals. 
Now, another sign of her acknowledged leadership in the field, and this is a quite amazing at her um, relatively early stage in, in uh, her career, is she's a grant review panel member for the ESRC, which awards many research grants in the social sciences in the UK. And given her interdisciplinary interest, she's also a panel member of the Interdisciplinary Research Advisory Panel for REF 2021. This is, for those of you who don't know, a UK program that evaluates universities and determines the money they receive. So it's very <laughs> important. She's also a consultant for several organizations, such as Merck, Mind Gym UK, and Save the Children. Um, as, as I'm sure people in this department have begun to um, realize, Professor von Stumm is a terrific colleague energetic, full of ideas, and fun. She's also extremely well organized, efficient, and effective, which I fear puts her at risk for uh, administrative work. And I think anything that takes her away, this is for Paul, <laughs> anything that takes her away from her research is a mistake, because she's one of the brightest and most creative researchers I know. I hope her move to York will allow her to settle down from her itinerant academic life. And I predict that uh, she no longer will be a rising star. I predict that her star will have risen so high in the sky over York, you can see it around the world. So please join me in congratulating Professor von Stumm and welcoming her inaugural lecture. Thank you so much uh, for these very kind and very generous words. <clears throat> um, research is me-search, as they say. And uh, today is a unique opportunity for me um, to describe the peculiar events that have led to me standing here today in front of you as a professor of psychology in education. Um, in September in 1986, I was three and a half years old, and I had my first day at kindergarten. And that was the single most dramatic experience of my life <laughs> up to that point but it still haunts me until today. It's not that the kindergarten was particularly unusual. Uh, we were about 30 Bavarian children, and to relive the moment some people are in Bavarian outfits today, um, uh, between the ages of three and six years, and uh, we had a large room with lots of toys, and we had a big garden with a sandbox out at the back. And I was familiar with toys and with sandboxes, uh, but I had never before met 29 other children. Uh, children who were of my age, who spoke my language, and who actually lived only a few streets from my own house. And yet, they were fundamentally different to me. Um, they didn't say or think or do the same things as I did. Uh, we all faced the same challenge, to entertain ourselves as best as possible during the kindergarten hours. But our approaches were so different. Uh, some kids would uh, build sand castles outside, some kids would draw pictures inside, uh, some kids would chase other kids around the playground. Um, I had my way of dealing with the situation. I, um, I preferred assisting the kindergarten staff. <laughs> I insisted on walking hand in hand with the kindergarten carer, um, and I would share my observations about the other kids' behavior uh, in serious conversations. And so you might think, I, quite rightly so, I was a born psychologist. Um, the observation that children differ, I got to confirm that at every level of education that I've reached, from primary school through to my PhD cohort. Um, and today, perhaps not surprising, it is my program of research. So the essence of individual differences research is trying to understand how and why we are so different. And differences between us are most obvious when they're in our physical traits. So some of us are blonde, some of us are brunette, some are tall, some are short. Uh, we have different builds, we have different eye color. Um, but we also differ in our psychological makeup. Uh, some of us are happier than others, some of us are more confident than others, some of us are cleverer than others. I'm particularly interested in individual differences in the ability to learn. Um, that is, to meet challenges, to master them, and to learn from the experience. In our society, learning challenges tend to come in the form of information processing tasks, like reading, writing, and arithmetic. And we learn these skills in school. And I study children's differences in school performance 
because school serves two very important functions. The first one is to equip us with the knowledge and the skills that are essential for us to successfully participate in society. But the second function is a gatekeeper to regulate the access to higher education or further educational qualifications. And further educational qualifications, like doing a degree, are on average associated with better life outcomes. People who have more education tend to live in bigger and nicer houses in better areas. They tend to earn more money. Um, they tend to live longer. They tend to live healthier. And um, uh, so I started to think about what predicts people's differences in learning what predicts differences in the accumulation of knowledge, and that was during my PhD. Um, I designed this conceptual model, which I'm very fond of, but uh, nobody wanted to publish it until today. So I'm trying to promote it here in the hope somebody will, will offer me an opportunity. And it was the attempt to combine the two key factors that influence learning, um, our cognitive abilities, um, our talents to learn, and then the personality traits that describe our tendency of how we approach learning in principle. And I think the two have an interplay between one another. They're behavioral mechanisms that we can identify that link them, and they inform gains in our information processing capacity and ultimately gains in our knowledge. Now, I call this the hungry mind, and I like the name so much, I called my lab the same way. It's the Hungry Mind Lab, and what we're trying to do is understand parts of this model to bring them together to an understanding of what is cognitive development and what are individual differences in cognitive development. When I started out, I was particularly interested in the personality part of things. And like every good PhD student, I reviewed the entire literature that's out there on personality traits that might be associated with learning. And through this very long and painful process, that every PhD student should go through nonetheless, um, I came to the conclusion that there are two key personality domains that we should consider when we try to understand learning outcome differences. The first one is intellectual curiosity. You might want to think about it as the hunger for knowledge. It describes a tendency to engage in abstract thinking, to seek out information, to engage in learning opportunities and in intellectual pursuits when they present themselves. The second domain is openness. You might want to think about that as the hunger for experience. Um, it's the idea that uh, we, are, uh, we have a preference for the new and different in many aspects of life. For example, you might want to try different foods, you might want to travel to different countries and experience their culture, or you might want to immerse yourself in different forms of art, and that is openness to experience. And what I was interested in is which of these two predicts the accumulation of knowledge. And we've done many studies on that in my lab, but I just wanted to show you three to give you a flavor of the kind of odd things that we ask participants to do. So here's the first one where we presented our participants with a website on an area of outstanding beauty that they were unlikely to know because it is actually no, an area. <laughs> It's um, in Croatia. These are the Plitvice lakes. It's a beautiful waterfall area. And we asked our participants to just look at this website as they felt about it. Like We didn't force them to do anything. But at the end, we surprised them with a little exam on it and said, how much did you actually take away from the information? Um, in a second study, we were a little more serious. So we gave our participants, we asked them to come in for three weeks. Every week, we gave them a very scholarly uh, long article, it's about five pages long, on serious complex topics, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis, or CRISPR, it's a gene editing method, or the dot-com bubble. And we asked them to afterwards pass an exam, so this time they were instructed. They knew the exam was coming, it's a very hard multiple choice test, and we promised them a lot of money if they got it right to really incentivize them to study hard. Um, and we did uh, something a little more simple where we presented people with little trivia facts. Um, this one was about sign language. And we let them read those trivia statements. And afterwards, we asked again, how much of the information did you retain? Does anyone know who first introduced sign language? You get brownie points if you give me the year on top. No preferences? Hmm. It was Juan Pablo Bonet. Anyone for the time? 
1620, a long time ago. Um, across all these studies, we found overwhelming consistent evidence that it is openness to experience that has the most positive, the strongest effect on the accumulation of knowledge and not intellectual curiosity. And you might think that this is counterintuitive because if you are hungry for knowledge and you want to learn and you seek out reading whenever you can, this is what should feed your knowledge primarily. Um, but I think the finding about openness is that it doesn't require you to recognize a learning opportunity as such. It doesn't need to be signposted as here's intellectual engagement on offer, but it's something we do on our day-to-day -day lives. In every ever so mundane experience, we can still something away, take something away that informs our knowledge and that helps build our capacities and our intellect. Now, this work is focused on adolescents, students, and adult populations. But more recently, I've started to think about uh, children's differences in school performance. Because the fascinating thing about that is that children differ enormously in their abilities to learn already in primary school, and we can see that very clearly. But the second point is that these differences are highly stable. So children who struggle in the first year of primary school relative to their other students will also struggle relative to the other students by the end of primary school. It's a very stable difference. And so the question I've been thinking about is what happens to us before we enter school that has such a pervasive influence that it drives differences in school performance when we start and makes them stable throughout? Well, what happens is your family, where you come from, your people. Um, they inform the environment that you grow up in, and they, with that, they influence, to a certain extent, how you will develop cognitively. And a few years ago, I could demonstrate that effect, that relationship between ba family background and cognitive development in a large cohort study. And what you see here is children who've been assessed on their cognitive development from the age of two through to 16 years, and uh, for the ease of interpretation, cognitive ability or cognitive development here is shown in terms of IQ points, because IQ is normed at 100 with a standard deviation of 15. And what you see, um, the lines represent are different levels of socioeconomic status. So that is basically different levels of families of their access to resources in society. And you can see very clearly, the, the graph is split into boys and girls, very classic, blue and red. We like it simple here. Um, and you have differences at the, at the age of two that are systematically associated with family background in a magnitude of about five IQ points. By the age of 16, that has magnified, it has in fact tripled. It's about one standard deviation difference that separates the children in the lowest SES group from those in the highest SES group in cognitive development. Now, my next question was, what drives this? What happens in these families? What creates those differences? And we've studied many different factors in my lab. We looked at food, the types of meals that families prepare for their children. And yes, people from more or families of more deprived backgrounds tend to feed their children more often prefabricated meals. And that has an effect on cognitive development. We looked at language environment, the way that parents speak to their children and how they then pick up language as a result. And my amazing PhD student is hiding somewhere in the room. Where is she hiding? Down there, yes, I see you, who led the work on, on the language environment. But the, the aspect that I want to talk about today, and Robert has hinted at that, is DNA because our parents don't only give us the house we grow up in and the environment that they provide for us, but they pass on DNA differences that we inherit and we have to make do with what we get, or maybe not. Um, we shall see. So how is this that we can look at DNA today? It's something that's only become possible over the past 15 years through something that's called a genome-wide association study. And genome-wide association studies help us to test for DNA variants that we carry in our genome and their association with a trait that we are interested in. So here we are interested in traits related to learning ability. And what you see in the graph is uh, the, the genome according to chromosomes. 
and you see little spikes here that indicate the extent to which a DNA variant is associated with the trait that we're looking at. Now, the main lesson that we learned from genome-wide association studies is that there's not one gene or two genes for learning or even a hundred, but it's many thousands of genetic factors with very small effect sizes. So what do you do with this information? You can't, you can't split people into groups saying smart genes, not so smart genes, let's see what happens next, because it is such a complex mess of genetic factors that go together. So what we have learned that we can do is we can just add them all together in individuals. So for any person where you have genotype data, you can use the information that you've taken from a genome-wide association study and then add their DNA points together. And you get a person-specific estimate of their genetic propensity for, in our case, the ability to learn. Now the question is, does this work? If we have a sample with a lot of DNA and we calculate these points, does it predict something that's associated with learning outcomes? Mm -hmm, it does. So here is a study we did very recently. Um, this is based on about 10,000 children who had their GCSEs taken at age 16, which in Britain at the time marked the end of compulsory schooling. And we have their genome-wide polygenic scores. What you see is the sample split into deciles. So you have the lowest scoring 10% on genome-wide polygenic scores here and the highest 10% there. And on the y-axis, you have GCSE scores or grades. So what you can see is that there's a linear relationship between people's genetic propensity for learning and the school grades that they actually earn. Um, I'll translate this into an effect size for you. In the lowest decile, on average, students get a C um, in their GCSEs. In the highest decile, that's an A minus. Now, I hope you can also see the many dots that are around the little boxes that go, you, that, that go to show that this is not a 100% foolproof association. There's a lot of people who score lower or higher on both dimensions and don't really fall exactly on the regression line. But as I'm spending my time with this sort of work and I'm thinking about uh, the predictive validity of genetic factors and how uh, informative this might be for our actual outcomes. Um, I thought in honor of this lecture and in order to contribute positively to science overall, I could look at my own genome and I could get some genome-wide polygenic scores for myself and see how that plays out against the things that we know about me. Um, and so I thought we start with a simple one, which is height. Height is highly heritable and we've been able to identify many genetic markers that predict height, so the score should be relatively good. Um, this is genetically where I am. I am at the 85th, 86th percentile for height. Um, I don't know if you can tell uh, how tall I actually am. I'm 173 centimeters, and I don't know the English system, so we'll have to leave it at that. But I, I, it, it just inspired me to look up how tall I am relative to the population, and there's amazing data on that out on the internet. So I can look up my birth year, my nationality, and then how tall the average person would have been, and I get a standard deviation, and it turns out that I score at the 84th percentile phenotypically for height. So we can say this genome-wide polygenic score thing is going well so far, right? Yeah. Okay, another one is smoking. Have you ever smoked? Some of you will know the answer to this already, but genetically I'm here with a slight above average tendency for smoking or genetic risk for smoking. And um, I tried uh, to find proof for my former sinful life. I don't do it anymore. But uh, there you are. Yes, I used to smoke. <laughs> so again, the genome-wide polygenic scores match my phenotypic development. Um, and now here's the one we've all been waiting for, <laughs> right, given the talk and the topic and challenges. Um, this is where I score genetically. I'm at the 37th percentile. And you see the line here, this is, would be the average, so I'm scoring below average. And so far, that didn't this can make concern me at all, because who knows where the other professors in this country score, right? <laughs> I mean, what is, what is the IQ of, uh, of the average professor? And it turns out there is data on that and speculations, and I did look that up. So apparently, uh, professors score, on average, on a 99th point six percentile, which is up here. So uh, I am a long way away from that. 
And so does that mean this is all a big mistake? I should be on that side of the theater and someone else should be here. Uh, and I think the answer is no. Um, it just means that it potentially took a lot of support to carry me over to the professorial finishing line. And I had support in many forms. I had support from brilliant minds in individual differences research, uh, starting with Ian Deary, who supervised my master's studies in Edinburgh. And then I did my PhD with Tomas Chamorro Pramutsik and Adrian Furnham in London. Um, my thinking about the hungry mind uh, was, it was very much inspired by Phil Ackerman, who's at Georgia Tech. Um, and my turn uh, to genetics is thanks to Robert Plowman, who convinced me somehow that uh, genetics is almost as interesting as curiosity as a subject of research. Um, but I also had your support, the support of this wonderful institution um, that has welcomed me so warmly with such enthusiasm and interest in my work. Um, and I know it's early days because I just moved here in January, but I cannot imagine a better place to work and live. I am totally in love with York University and city, and it's really fantastic to have this opportunity here. My greatest thanks, uh, of course, have to go to my family. Um, my wonderful parents, who um, didn't only pass on their genes to me, um, but they also had an infallible talent for spotting my academic deficits before I did, and uh, uh, sent me early on to an institute to treat my dyscalculia. I was there for three years. I would not have made A-levels otherwise. Um, and they advised me correctly where to find a place to study psychology without meeting the numerus clausus, which is the entry criteria to university in Germany. Again, I didn't quite cut the bar. Um, I have a wonderful big family with lots of uncles and aunts, who, uh, many of whom are here today, and they instilled a very firm sense of security in me early on, um, and let me know always that if I needed help, they were there to give it, and I have made great use of that in the past, and I will reserve the right for the future. Um, but the absolute uh, deepest thanks uh, that I have at this moment is for three amazing women in my life who um, have helped me to be here today. My little sister Maria, who um, <laughs> spent a lot of time in Manchester Airport today as a service to this event, um, but who also told me my first lesson in individual differences. Because even though I'm the older one, she only at occasion followed my instructions. <laughs> and I think it was all the better for us because uh, she made me successfully overcome my adolescent tardiness and got me to school on time before they actually threw me out uh, in the final year uh, of, of my education. Um, my wonderful mother, who has come around to individual differences and genetics, uh, even though she had healthy skepticism about both, and resistance. But it was that resistance and skepticism that I think made me sharpen my arguments and develop what I hope is an almost flawless program of research in both areas. And my grandmother, who I miss every day, but especially today, because she would have been incredibly proud of this, and it's a very happy occasion um, to celebrate. So, why are we so different? It's complicated. I cannot give you a complete answer today, but I hope you'll take away two things from this talk. One is that children differ in their ability to learn, and the other one is that family is important. Thank you.